Hey everyone, we're back with another AI conversation. And I'm very, very happy to have me today. Uh, someone I've been following on LinkedIn for some time. Uh, they, let me know if I pronounce it right. David Knickerbocker. Yep, hey, David. Right. Yeah. Hi. So welcome to the show, uh, David. Uh, you're, you're quite famous, at least from my perspective on LinkedIn, but maybe for the one or two people who don't know you, <laughs> maybe can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what, what you're busy with? Sure, I can do that. So my name is David Knickerbocker. Um, I'm definitely an engineer. <laughs> Uh, I've been working in data, period, just all over data um, my whole entire life. I, I started programming when I was six years old and built my first database when I was about 16 years old, and I'm 45 now. So my entire life is data and databases and working with data. Of some Wait, sort. David, can I pause you there? I'm 45, and I also started coding at six with a TI-994, a basic computer. And I also built a database using DBase3 when I was 16. I don't know if I just met my alter ego <laughs> across the shorts. That's awesome. That's anyway, awesome. Go, back to you, back to you, man. Tell us more. <laughs> no, that's really cool. And I think my first database was probably just some little access database looking back um, because I learned about MySQL uh, in, in 1999. Um, so there's that access to a real database at some point. Um, and access was very easy to, to do. Anybody could do an access database, really, to be honest. Um, but yeah, my whole life has been just coding and working with data. And so to me, at this point, I don't really think about programming as programming because I've been doing it my whole entire life. Like to me, code is just a language that I use to get computers to do the thing that I want them to do. Um, and at this point, I've used many, many different languages because I've been doing this forever. Um, my, I wrote a book last year called Network Science with Python. And so... Um, really good book. Thank you. And so a lot of the work that I do these days is with Python. But if you met me about six years ago, I was talking a lot of smack about Python because it lacks brackets and all kinds of other things that you'll often hear C programmers and stuff talk about. So I'm not a one-trick pony. I've been around um, lots of different programming languages and can do SQL in my sleep and stuff like that. Uh, you just... Uh, it's just a way of thinking. So um, I'm an engineer. Uh, in the very beginning, I was a web developer um, during the early World Wide Web. And then bad guys learned how to hack websites. And we had to learn how to integrate security into our websites. Um, so the early internet was a very good chance to learn programming and databases and security and social engineering and all, all these different related things that really, really matter. So I'm fortunate to come from a time, I guess, much like now, where there was so much change. The early yeah. internet was yeah. so much excitement. And uh, everybody wanted to be a web developer in 1999. It was much like today, where everybody wants to be an AI. It was that same level of excitement about web development during the early internet. E-commerce was massive. It was exactly the way that people talk about AI today. Um, so I've been around the hype cycles quite a while, um, and I'm and I've seen... Uh, my industry just move like like this. So it's nice to meet you all. And um, a bit of my background for companies I used to work for, uh, I, I now have my own company. Uh, we just, we're in the process of renaming it. So I'll, I'll tell, you, tell you that later. You can find it on my LinkedIn. Um, but I'm still not used to the new name. Um, but I started my own company two years ago. And before that, I worked for McAfee, the antivirus company. Um, and before that, I worked for Intel. And before that, I worked for um, like the U.S. Navy Hospital and stuff like that. So I've just been around everywhere. But the one thing for me has always been about using technology to either make people's lives better or save lives. And uh, so that's really very much about my mission. It's not just that I, I want to chase money because this stuff pays well no matter what. Um, it's that. I only care about chasing problems that I feel are very important. So previously I worked uh, on, you know, McAfee is the antivirus company. So antivirus keeps our less tech savvy and our tech savvy relatives and ourselves safe. Um, but, but antivirus is very important and working for a hospital saved lives or, or helped save lives. So that's very important too. So that's a bit about me. Nice to meet you all. That's a great, great background. Did you ever get to work with John himself? You know, John's quite a colorful fellow. No, actually, that's a really, really funny story. Because um, I was told my first day at the company to never, ever mention him. 
Um, they, they, they really did not like him at the time. And I don't work for them anymore, so I'm allowed to. And he's he's dead now, um, I believe, right? I think well, that's the official word. Netflix says he's dead, so I guess. <laughs> but yeah, they um, that was the weirdest thing. Um, they, they didn't like talking about him. It was a very different company. So mm. yeah. some of that. Yeah, he was long gone by then. That's awesome. No, I mean, as I said, we're practically you know, doppelgangers. I came by the data field by way of finance. So I came in as an accountant and then learned MS Access was kind of my secret weapon as well in the office because they wouldn't IT wouldn't allow us to deploy any decent databases. And for yep. some reason, MS Office has a database that most people don't know about. And That's still right. is there, by the way. And they haven't deprecated it. So it's still there. Um, okay. Um, what got me really interested in your stuff, uh, David, is you, you, you've you been posting a lot about networks. So I'd like to learn more about your journey there. And more recently, NLP, or is it the other way around? So could you share with us? I think you had this 100 days of networks or 100 days of NLP. Uh, yeah. It was really good, really impressive. So can you share more about what, what you've been yeah, doing? Yeah, I would love to, actually. And um and. So I, I've been working with networks my whole, whole adult life, but I never realized it. And um, I say this because when you work with databases, you often learn about entity relationship diagrams. Right. And entity relationship diagrams are how the different tables in the database are connected. So in a relational database, the tables form a network, um, which means that I was building um, network visualizations in the 90s without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of forgot about that idea for a, a really, really long time. Um, but when I took a data science class several years ago, um, I had a class in social network analysis. And it made me think about if people are connected, oh, my God, code works this way, too. Oh, my God, tables work this way, too. Oh, my God, lots of places in nature work this way, too, you know? And um, I started seeing networks everywhere. There's a there's a book called Network Science by Alberto Barabasi. But he also wrote another book afterwards called Linked. Or maybe he wrote it first. And I, I don't remember. But it's called Linked. And Linked is more for the layman. Um, it explains how networks are everywhere and how networks can be useful in understanding things like um, how complicated things happen, you know, how, how people turn against each other or how information is made, you know, information comes from a whole bunch of different ideas coming together or um, how malware evolves. For instance, I used networks to understand malware evolution in, in some previous work. Um, once you learn to see networks, you see them everywhere. Like right now, we are two nodes having a conversation. So we are essentially two dots with a line between us. And all of our readers or all of our listeners right now, um, you know, they're nodes too. They're, and, and they're lines connecting to us too. Um, but we can't see them because they're after the fact. But networks are just everywhere and in everything. And I never, and I knew that, you know, we've, we've always talked about how everything is connected. You know, that's, that's a frequent thing that comes up in human conversations but i never knew that there was a way to actually study them the way that that i have learned how to study them um you know the internet is tcp ip networks it's computer networks and so when we hear networks these days there's a lot of confusion that that you know maybe this person's just talking about a computer network and that's a hard thing about teaching network science is that you know initially somebody might assume that you're talking about computer networks but I'm talking about networks in general, about how everything is connected. Um, and, and that goes to the very small, but also to the very large, you know, galaxy scale. So it's it's very cool stuff. And um, did, the techniques- did, did you ever study like network engineering, like formally? Because you could just correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think they actually teach network science. I mean, the way we are understanding it. Uh, they, they don't. Yeah. In network engineering, right? They don't. That's right, and it's and it's kind of a shame too that it's not uh, be, because these tools could be extremely useful in like TCP/IP networks to understand, um, you know, which infrastructure is the most important, or uh, which infrastructure most data flows through, for instance. But they don't, and 
to be honest with you, I actually don't like computer networks. Like this is a weird thing about me. Um, from the early internet, I wanted to be an application developer. And so from the early internet, a lot of people became network engineers and a lot of people became application developers. And I wanted to go become an application developer. I don't like doing subnet masking. Um, I don't like thinking about IP addresses and stuff like that. It's just not my thing. But to your point, these techniques would take a network engineer and just supercharge their knowledge. Yeah, they're aware. Yes. And then like you that. have to analyze topologies with 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 data. <laughs> it's really yeah. ironic, you know, if you if you think about it. It is, and uh, yeah. So so I use these at McAfee and Intel very often to map out production data flows, um, and and that has to do with computer networks too, because servers are servers, and so I would map out. You know, this server talks to that server, and in this and this server, it's running this script, which reads this file, and so um, that's a very that's a simplification. But when you map out an entire data center like that, just to be real short, I was able to troubleshoot problems in seconds that used to take days, because if an export failed, all you have to do is find the export in the network and move back one node, and that's the thing that failed or the thing before it failed. So it's very easy to isolate the problem if you have a network map. And that got me some recognition at McAfee um, and awards and stuff like that. But it was very hard to teach this stuff because what I teach in my book is, is pretty complicated. Like it's not a five minute, um, it's not a five minute blog, you know? You, you can learn some very quick basics, but not enough to actually be, be very good at it. Yeah, I think in some ways, it's it's the analytical side of networks as opposed to kind of the procedural side, which I think everyone else sort of knows. And sometimes those procedures are unnecessarily complicated as well. While on the analytical side, people don't get into it deep enough. Um, yeah. I agree with you completely on that. And um, I was actually explaining this today. A lot of people stop at whole network analysis. Like they will... They'll make the whole network and they'll feed it into Neo4j or something like that. But whole network analysis is barely scratching the surface. The, the power really happens when you break the network apart into communities or when you identify the important nodes or when you look at the egos um, and, and to see the different nodes that are around those egos or to look at the bridges or there's all, there's just so much more that people could be doing. And I try to explain that in my book. I also wrote a blog um, that I'm I'm trying to write about an article every week, and that's called 100 Days of Networks, and it's on Substack, so y'all can go find that. And so those are in a little bit bite-sized pieces, but it's it all adds up. Like day one is very simple, and now I'm on day 16, so we're getting kind of into the weeds. And probably by the time I get to like day 90, we'll be doing some crazy futuristic sci-fi stuff. So, you know, one thing that still amazes me because. Uh, I don't know if it, this is still true, but I've always thought network analysis was really off the beaten track compared to in, in data analysis. I mean, you, you talk to data analysts, data scientists, few, few of them, surprisingly few of them are into networks. They're mostly into the usual regression stuff uh, uh, and true. statistics, but networks offer a totally different view of how to appreciate data. And I'm still blown away but about how uh, like fundamental, like the math of it. I mean, we're talking about the math again. Like, like, uh, like looking at how connected nodes are. You you mentioned communities. I mean, mm -hmm. concepts like modularity, which I'm sure uh, come up often. I mean, it's a mathematical concept, but yeah, yeah, the way it translates to real world applications across multiple domains, I'm just so blown away that. Hey, modularity here, modularity there, <laughs> or you know, right. be between us here, between us there. It's it's like it's a it's a law of the universe that's coded into how networks work. I don't know, thinking out loud. I believe I believe that too, and and I have I have the weirdest conversations with friends because you know we're we're all just trying to figure out why the universe creates networks, and and that's a really big question. Like, why do these networks keep happening in nature? Because if you look at language word use, you know, which words go together, they create a network. If you look at the animal food chain, that creates a network. 
Um, if you analyze religion, um, religious social networks, like people stick to the their social groups. Um, if you look at crime or uh, abuse or or things like that, there are dark networks that exist too. And so, but somehow these networks networks are like are the structure of how things get put together very often in the network uh, in the in the universe. Um, and getting back to kind of the the language part of things, I think of networks and language as just being two parts of a reality. And um, so when I talk about NLP, I'm usually not trying to do something like ChatGPT. I'm not trying to create an LLM or something like that. Usually I'm doing something much, much simpler, like classification of, of something. I'm trying to find something, a needle in a massive haystack. And for that, classifiers are very, very useful, or clustering can be very, very useful. So I do a ton with machine learning, um, but I also do a ton with network science. And to your point, data scientists fixate on machine learning, but often don't even approach network science. It's uh, like you'll hear somebody say, yeah, I studied this in grad school. Like, like that's the end of it. Yeah, it's very, very academic way of yeah. thinking about it, right? That, that's the very beginning of it. You know, they should follow me and they should go way into the weeds and, and see what you can do because uh, a network is a system, you know, and there are different parts to the system. And so there are communities and there are important nodes and things like that, but it's a system. It's almost like it's a living thing. And the analysis that I show how to do, it's, it's really like being able to query the system, you know? So kind of what people talk about with AI, um, there's a lot of room for graph in AI, you know, and, and, uh, but it doesn't really get talked about very much. Like yeah, actually, find... I mean, I'm, I might just be scratching the surface as well, but you just gave me an idea because uh, all, all this talk about large language models don't seem to mention that at the heart of it, like the transformer is a matrix, the attention matrix, and, and a graph is a matrix. So, I just gave me an idea of maybe another side project. Like, how do you break up a large language model into a graph? Because it's really words connecting to other words, and that's how these models create sentences, and that's how somehow yeah. for somehow meaning arrives out of that. Anyway, sorry, digression. But no, just, that that's a that's a, that's a real that's a real thought and a real point and something that I've actually done. So back in uh, twenty nineteen or twenty twenty, I was doing some work on deep fake defense. I was yeah. working for Mac yeah. and. and uh, like in 2016, people suddenly got really paranoid about deep fakes because the first ones were created. And us in cybersecurity, we're paranoid people to begin with, you know. And so we were all thinking, this is the ultimate weapon, you know. And I don't necessarily believe that anymore because there's a lot of ultimate weapons. Um, but deep fakes are being used today, like right now. Um, and so I was doing deep, deep fake defense type stuff. Uh, work in 2019 ish, but I was I cared about the language part of it, and my coworker was doing things like looking for lip movement or you know an AI like it'll have too many fingers and stuff like that, just looking for those kinds of relics or artifacts. Um, whereas I was really fascinated already with natural language processing, so I've got a picture on my phone I can send you later on that is one of the language networks of back then, and it's just. It's a much, much more dense network. But when you compare AI language to human language side by side, the two networks are distinct. Um, they're very different. Uh, and, and, and this is probably because of the old GPT models were just weak. And, and maybe the newer models don't have the same weakness or as much of it. <clears throat> But like humans, we use the right word at the right time. Like if we if we needed to use the word xylophone, we would hopefully just use it at the right time. We wouldn't hallucinate the word xylophone into existence in a random sentence at work. People would start scratching their head and, and stop trusting us. But hallucinations do happen in large language models because of how they're built to predict words. And as a result, when you do, uh, I, I created a word network back then. And what I found is that the large language models kind of the outer edges, the more rare words, they didn't have as many lines to them. And so this showed in the network visualization as a very spiky outer side to the network, whereas the human network itself was, was 
much more fuzzy. Like it was much less spiky because humans are more nuanced into the words that we use. So what you're describing is something that I've done. Creating word networks is is really fascinating. That's awesome. I mean, that could be a step towards, and again, somebody might be doing it already, finally cracking the code. Because so far, AI detectors have just failed miserably at detecting AI. And yeah. and then just, just gives me another idea of using the, the graph as a fingerprint, like look, create a graph out of you know the, the text that this That's model right. produces and compare that to the graph of like normal human stuff. That could that's, be part of it, you know. That could be part of the detection process. And, and that's a that's a cool idea too. Like, there's a there's a shoot, man. We were just bouncing ideas off each other today. Um, like, there's a thing called K Corona. Mm -hmm. um, a K core is used to see the core of the network, the, the inside. So if you give K core the highest number possible, it will identify the core of that network. And that's something that I do. I don't see many people explaining to do that, but it's something I do because it reveals a lot about what influences a network. And I deal with people networks. So word yeah, networks we, are better. We, we did a piece of work because I'm, I'm quite active in the disinformation space or anti-disinformation rather, just to be clear. Um, yeah. And, and uh, network analysis has been useful in that regard. Like there, there's this phenomena known as donuts where you have one or two nodes and then you have a big donut around them. That yeah. That is a telltale sign that you know, there's some active promotion of some message going on and it's centered on a few players and then the network just spreads it out, which which is odd uh, given like normal discourse, people throwing tweets at each other, don't create these donuts That's or right. they appear in small. So that has a mathematical fingerprint and, that, and, right. we use, and we use that to in a way judge whether there's some active influence operations going on on Facebook or Twitter. So yeah, I mean that could be the step towards getting getting our heads around this fake news phenomena because uh, exactly. I, I deal with journalists. They're spooked. They're completely freaked out at how AI is a taking over their jobs and b beating them at the news game. And yeah. strangely, I don't know if it's the same uh, in the states. There's still this weird wall between journalists and tech. They kind of don't get along, and that's yeah. a shame. You know, yeah, it's a good idea. It's a good thing we have That's this cool. chat. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm, I'm I'm with you. Like I, I I look at some of the same type things, and 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 the thing that that I'm most interested in is really influence, and how things influence other things. So, like you were talking about, you do start to see these interesting patterns with like disinformation or artificial amplification and things like that. So very cool. Um, but yeah, like getting back to the language thing. Um, you know, yeah. K core is yeah. useful to look at the actual core of a network. But if we, if you wanted to look at the outer parts of a network to see if they were different than like human, you could look at K corona instead of K core. Whereas like the corona looks at the outer edges. So if you looked at K corona with a K of zero or one, then you would get a a, um, a subgraph of only the outer edges, the outer parts of the network. But I, I don't know if that's a good idea. It might be a total. It's worth, it's worth testing. I mean, that's that's the cool part about data. You know, it, the data will be the judge if it's worth worth it or not. But it's not a reason not to try it, right? Yeah. There's yeah. There's a there's a book I'm reading, and and it just says that it's really about just clever questions. Yeah. Of, of nature, it's really about doing something clever to get your answer, and and sometimes we don't think about. We don't think of a clever approach because we're thinking in lists like maybe if we are thinking networks if we did understand this stuff better then we would start asking better questions to to unravel this because if you can measure it you can detect it and if you can detect it then you can do something about it yeah applications so. can be created okay um i'm really liking the vibe where we're headed um if you don't mind i want to dial it back to how did how did you develop kind of this intuition? I mean, you said you're an engineer, uh, you're more in the practical stuff. I mean, certainly it's it's one thing after another. Can you can you recall how you started to develop kind of this intuition about how data works and obviously networks? I mean, what, what, yeah. what was your thought process? Yeah, for sure. Like en engineering is always at the root of it, understanding how things work. 
or or building things so that they work in a way that you want them to work. So either, either you're making something work or you're understanding how something works. And there's always been some of it because of like the relational databases, you know, like relational databases, um, an application will use a few tables. And so there's always a relationship between one application and a few tables. And another application might be using a few other tables. So even the ER diagram is not the whole picture compared to how an application actually uses the database itself. And my work was in data operations and I needed to understand how things work and how things fit together. And spreadsheets will never give you that answer. You know, spreadsheets can kind of tell you what somebody wrote down in a spreadsheet that, that they thought how things worked. Um, but I was brought onto a team in 2015 and they asked me to do a very difficult server migration. Um, they didn't tell me that a whole bunch of teams tried before me and failed. Um, <laughs> I had no idea how difficult it was going to be, but during that first process, I didn't know network science and I, I came up with all of these different techniques to audit a server to understand what code ran on it. And then in that code, what databases were referenced and um, what tables were referenced and so on and so on. And it was a whole lot to hold into my head. And I probably had like, I probably had dozens of text files and spreadsheets that I used to help me get through that server migration because it had like 180 programs that ran on that one server. It was a complicated beast, not, not a one trick type thing. You know, it was very messy. And we, and we managed to pull it off and, and do it perfectly. But it was a lot to hold into my head. And then somewhere between that first one and the second time I did it, I learned network science. So after I learned network science, I took some of the things that I learned from that first one and redid them using a graph. And the first thing I realized was that, oh my God, I don't have to hold any of this in my head. Like that's a huge thing, um, which mean which meant that I had no anxiety on migration day because I already mapped out a graph. I can use that to query the, the, the server to know how things work and stuff like that. Um, I'm, I'm reading off course, but it's, it's basically old methods were inadequate for complicated work and yeah. graphs yeah. make short work of complicated work. So things like spreadsheets are garbage for server migrations. Things like graphs literally made me 10 times faster. What well, used to take me uh, months, three months, right? You can now be done in a week. So it, it used to take me um, about two weeks to even map out how a server would work and, and, uh, and, and just turn it into like a nested script calling type thing. But after the graph, after the graph approach was figured out, I could um, dissect the server in about one day. So it was a huge increase all around um, and our migrations never failed. So the, the first migration that we did, it took us about 13 months, I think. And then after that, we were knocking out server migration after server migration. We did 20 in a year. So we went from one a year to 20 in a year with zero failures at all. And it's just one of those things, you know, once you learn a better way of doing things, you're never going to go back to the old way of doing things. You cannot possibly, you know? So that's kind of how it was. It, it was, this became like the ultimate tool for data operations. Like data operations has to do with understanding how data moves from point A to point B and that's a network. So a spreadsheet doesn't even make any sense to begin with, you know? Have, have you had any opportunities to, because I haven't had a look at graph neural networks. That's another topic that, it's still on kind of, kind of my cork board. And the idea was a typical neural network is like usually just one direction, like feed forward, or maybe there's some convolution to it. But nodes are kind of kind of forced to interact in a very deliberate way. Graph neural networks kind of explode that. You know, I don't know. Just thinking I uh, out loud that that might for at least for me that might be the next frontier because deep learning so far. It, it has its drawbacks, but it's been pretty impressive so far, you know, and it's resulted in yeah. these language models. And as I mentioned earlier, at the heart of that is a is a graph or a, 
you know, uh, a network. Anyway, uh, talk yeah. about NLP. Um, no, there are, there are though. Uh, to answer your question on that, like, yeah, yeah, yes. And um, the last chapter in my book, maybe, let me see. I wrote this a year ago, so I don't remember exactly. Yeah, the last chapter in my book is about a Python library called Karate Club. And Karate Club... Karate is, Club? Uh, I'll check that out. Yeah. Karate Club is awesome. Um, and it's very easy to work with. If you, if you read the last chapter of my book, it, it will make short work of, of your learning for how to use Karate Club. Because I, I show how to use it for community detection. And I show you how to use it to extract node vectors for graphs. So there's different ways that you can do graph machine learning. And actually, one of my more, more recent blog posts also shows a little bit about how to do classification with, with graphs. Um, but, I, but also, previously, I did work on a project um, at McAfee for graph neural networks. And we tried a bunch of stuff. And, you know, even and that project didn't really go anywhere. But some, it, but a project doesn't really have to go anywhere for you to learn from it. Like, it was still a really good learning opportunity for us to figure out what worked and what didn't work and how much of a headache it was and all the different approaches that there are. But there's different approaches to doing graph neural networks. Um, the approach that I personally, I like the best is to just take certain features from a graph, like between the centrality or density or, or certain things like that, and use those as graph features because then I can actually um, get some explainability back from the model on why the model do, did things. Whereas if you use like node vectors, you don't really get information back. It's just the model works and it predicts right, but you don't know why. And I don't like that. So I don't really like black box models. I prefer to do graph machine learning, I guess from the feature engineering approach, kind of, kind of how I wrote about it. So. Yeah, I think that's that's still something that haunts the deep learning community up to now. Um, it 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 it's not a black box in the sense that you know what the nodes are doing, you know the values per node, but they just can't figure it out. They don't know why <laughs> the nodes are doing what. And yeah, I I kind of get you where network science gives you a bit more of the why. Okay, this particular node that's seems right. to be is important whenever this thing becomes a cat <laughs> or, you know, but that node is more important if this thing becomes a dog and, and yeah. Okay. That's another idea on the cork board. We have to put that in and uh, try uh, to figure that out. And, and, uh, and the other thing is too, like I, I'm really hesitant to do machine learning off of graphs alone because there are shapes that appear in graphs all the time. There are different kinds of clusters that appear in graphs all the time and they can tell you a little bit about something. Yeah, But just because something looks this way in a certain part of the network, let's, let's say that you have this cluster over here that's all a, a bad thing, right? And you decide that you want to be able to predict everywhere else in the network that looks like this bad thing. It's just a collaborative structure. Everybody in that structure works together, and so it's densely connected. And if you build a classifier to detect nodes that have that same kind of graph behavior, all you're going to find is clusters it doesn't mean that you found the bad guys. It just means that you found the nodes that look like these other nodes. So you have to do more than just do predictions off of graphs, in my opinion. Um, I think that NLP is very useful because it gives you a bit more understanding on context, like what, what's actually um, in, in stuff, you know. Um, but I very rarely do machine learning on graphs only by themselves. In my book, I wrote about this one classifier, I believe it was, it was either a classifier or it just created node vectors. Maybe it's just created node vectors. Um, but I think it's called Feather. And it seemed like it was able to actually take both a raw graph itself, so you can pass in G, but you can also pass in X, which is all kinds of other cool um, feature data. So like, for instance, if you were to pass in a graph and TFIDF, that might be interesting, you know, because then you've got the nodes and you've got uh, more information with the nodes and you can use that together to create a, a different kind of embedding. Um, but that's something that I only spent about two hours on. I'm, I'm not super familiar with Feather other than I got really excited about it and told all my friends to check it out. And then I forgot about it until now. Hey, so. Have you have you heard of Gorse? G-O-U-R-C-E. 
So it's a visualization library. It was it developed years ago. And it basically animates a network over time. So it's based, it was originally based on Git GitHub commits. So it shows you like how many people are committing to a project. And over time you see the network grow and implode and explode. You should check it out. I'll send it to you. No uh, because that's a that's another dimension that isn't explored a lot. Like we we tend to use uh, right. visualized networks as is, like a static mm -hmm. thing. But these right. things change. These things move. Right. And I I had the same criticism of uh, some unsupervised learning methods like clustering back in the day, where because uh, you know how people use clustering. Oh, you have this uh, silhouette or. Uh, mean squared error, and and that's how you know a cluster is a clustering analysis is accurate, but it it seemed to lack kind of that rigor that traditional statistics has, like you have a train set and a test set. So my recommendation, because I, I I also do a bit of lecturing in school to students, like whenever you do clustering, try to bring a bit of that train and test rigor, like you do a cluster as of time x and then see if the same relationships hold as of time Y. And that's how you know your cluster is actually solid. It's not something random. Um, so I surmise some there could be a similar dynamic in networks as well. Networks change, they mutate, but certain, but certain relationships hold over time. So you know, so it's one yeah. thing to say this node is a centrality of blank, but if it's a centrality that persists over a period, then you know that that thing's really important. It wasn't just important as of that. Well, so, like it's, it gets even cooler because you've converted graph into a time series problem. And, yeah. and you can do time series analysis on the graph data afterwards to understand uh, trends, you know. And I, I, if you go to my blog, I, uh, so I haven't written about it in my book, but I'm going to do it in the second edition. Um, I just forgot to write it in the first edition of my book because um, I figured it out before I wrote my book. But I wrote a, a blog post about temporal network analysis is what I call this. Yeah, and that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Visualizing yeah. networks over time. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And, and so I wrote about an easy process of not only doing temporal and ne temporal network analysis, but I also came up with my own technique to visualize what changed, to basically visualize what is no longer there. So imagine that, you know, 10 nodes disappeared. You'll notice that if you look at uh, slide zero and then slide one, you'll notice that it's smaller, but then you're going to have to go back with your eyeballs and try to figure out. Dial it back. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I came up with my own technique a couple of weeks ago that takes what changed and converts and creates a graph out of what changed. Because oh, imagine. Okay. Imagine that you tell your 10 friends to boycott this company. Yeah. You're going to be the center node to those 10 people um, and, and it, in the form of a star, you know. Um, if you don't visualize what's gone, which seems weird, <laughs> it's cool that you can even do that, you know. It's cool that it worked so well, but it worked perfectly. But you can actually visualize what is no longer there. Um, and, and it's a difference. And yeah, it's I mean... Possible. So it's like a network of the delta of the previous network, something like that, right? Hmm. Yeah, it was very simple to do once I cracked it. So, yeah, and and cool. that that that'll generate a whole slew of new characteristics because now you're looking at change. So it's not just centrality; it's change in centrality. Suddenly, every other factor in the network has a temporal dimension. And that can then be used as a feature to predict something else. So, uh, and under, if you and if you do things countries. with enough, if you do things with enough sensitivity, then you like for instance, let's say that you're a brand, and you notice that people are starting to slide off of your brand. They're starting to, to care less about you. Yeah. If you use temporal networks analysis, you would be able to see the downward trend. You'd be able to see your centrality scores dropping off. You know. Yeah. yeah. But if you do what I just described, you can even see where it's coming from. You can even see if it's coming from just a couple communities. And if you see it quick enough, you can do something about that. You know, you can do some marketing to stifle that bleed out, you know, so. Yeah, I, I mean, the in, in the social network uh, stuff we did, that was actually very important because one thing I like about networks is it's very hard to fake a network. <laughs> you know, it'll look yeah. fake once you see it. 
Uh, and e- even if people try to hide their tracks, a network will show it plain as day. So it, it's, it comes close to very close to kind of like understanding the fundamental behavior of anything using a network. That's right. They're, they're beautiful things. Uh, people ask so many questions about, like people are very skeptical about using graphs. That That's one thing that is very are frustrating. They? Are they? Yeah. Wow, amazing. Like a, lot, a lot of people are excited about graph databases. And they get excited about graph machine learning. And they get excited about things that have the word graph in it. But if you bring up network science, it's like crickets. You know, um, It's not the same thing as LLMs or machine learning. Like If I wrote a book on machine learning, it probably would have sold 100 times more. But I didn't want to. I wanted to wrote a, write a book that would fundamentally change how people think. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what, what I did. And... But I, I got pushback from my managers and uh, some jobs like the graph visualizations are complicated to look at. You know, it's not a bar chart with five bars. It's a complicated spider web on your screen. And so if your storytelling sucks, then it's hard to explain what you're seeing. Um, and if you're if you're not very intelligent, then you're going to explain it wrong. You know, so there's skepticism of graphs because they're complex and you have to know what you're doing with them and, and stuff. Okay. And that's just part of the, the thing, but it's a good exercise in storytelling. It's just, it's hard mode. So. No, I mean, you'd think after a pandemic, people would be more mindful of networks because that was a great way to analyze patient zero, you know, and yeah. con- contact tracing. Um, yeah. You make a very good point. I mean, just in hindsight, thinking out loud. I thought people were just weren't familiar with it, but yeah, there may there may be some hesitation there. Maybe because the word network throws them off. It sounds very IT, <laughs> and yeah. it sounds very TCP/IP, as you said. And exactly. and data analysts, data scientists don't want to have anything to do with that. Maybe the data engineers uh, again, and we yeah, have, and yeah. I I think it kind of hasn't been popularized well enough yet either. And that's another thing that I kind of try to do. The, the way that I describe how I wrote this book, I wrote this book so that my non-technical parents could read it easily. Um, my goal for writing this book, I, I have some books where social scientists will say, we use this network for this analysis. It's a very small network. You could do much more big, uh, much bigger networks if you had software engineers. So when I read that in some of my earlier books, I thought, why don't I write a book that teaches social scientists a little bit of programming and teaches programmers a little bit of social science? That way we can do some really, really exciting, cool new stuff together, you know? And um, But I don't feel that this has been popularized enough. You know, like when people think about networks, they think of computer networks. Mm. Um, and in a pandemic, they kind of think, about, you know, don't touch other people like <laughs> they, they we know that we can get each other sick but we don't just we don't talk about it too much people still use google sheets all day long you know people still use spreadsheets all day long we're still very much in in an old paradigm i think maybe it, a bit of it is the accessibility of it certainly with python there's a lot uh, i mean the accessibility is improved but you still kind of need to be a coder i remember uh, like I still use Gephi a lot. That was also kind of a hard tool to use, although it was drag and drop. Neo4j as well uh, tries to bring graph theory to databases, but I don't think you know you, your non coders will even be bothered. I mean, Neo4j has its own language, to be honest. That's so, right. And uh, there's Pajek too, P A J A E K. And uh, I wrote this book because. Why pay for something that you can do for free? You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And and uh, when you do things with code, you learn how to basically write questions to the graph. You learn how to get what you want out of it. Whereas if you use a graph database, then you're limited to what the graph database can do. Or if you use Gephi, for one thing, Gephi hadn't been updated in like six years yeah. for a long time. And I stopped. I was not even interested in using something that was six years out of date. Yeah. Um, but but I'm on a perpetual lookout for better visualization because like to be honest, Python's visualization for networks suck. It's not very good. Like Scikit yeah. Network is okay, but it's gnarly, and Network X's visualization is slow. Yeah. So you're 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 either going to write gnarly code that's fast, 
or you're going to write clean code that's slow and yeah you know, I've, so I've had more luck on the javascript side uh, of, of things to visualize but yep. what what you lack the javascript side though is the analysis so yeah you yep. can visualize a network but it'll it'll be a bit harder to get all the network statistics exactly. out uh, and then you're back yeah. to network x so yeah, it sounds like a product waiting to happen. <laughs> you, you can feel my pain. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like my my the first edition of my book, I got this one function that I wrote called draw graph. Mm. Um, and, and, that <laughs> yep. one, and that one and that one function replaces Pajek or Gephi or anything because because it renders whatever. It'll render a uh, ego or it'll render a community or it'll render the whole graph. So that's a cool function. But like we had a problem yesterday. Uh, where you know network x somebody was using a more recent version of network x than me mm. and something had something had been deprecated so when you have gnarly code something's inevitably going to break you know um and we just have no perfect tool yet like i, I want network x to bring in scikit network or or bring in some of the js stuff can you imagine that like if if network x could, could do the JS visualizations, wouldn't that be cool? Fire, like that'd be amazing. Well, they got it. They 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 were ma they managed to be able to do that with the Plotly library. So the Plotly library for Python and JavaScript are nearly interchangeable now. So yeah, it just takes a commitment from some community to do it, and yeah, maybe that's the problem. Maybe there's a problem yeah. waiting to be solved. <laughs> we need to create that's this right. network community, <laughs> a network that's of networks. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, I just realized we're almost at the hour. How about that? So I'm um, thinking out loud. Maybe could you share a little bit of what's what's up ahead? I mean, we haven't talked about uh, much about AI. What do you think of AI, where it stands now? Obviously, it's going through its own hype cycle. But from your instinct, what what are the things that feel legit? And what are the things that don't really wash from your perspective? What? So to me, AI is just doing something that a human does, but with superhuman ability. And that's been here for a long time. Like I've built many classifiers that read that breed at superhuman ability um, or look at certain things that with high speed, you know. So AI is here for sure. If you if you define it just by it does something that we do much better than we do. So I I don't believe that all AI is hype, but Every time a new technology comes out, it seems like that one technology kind of gets flagged as the example of AI and everything else isn't quite AI, you know? Mm -hmm. And so yep. like, hey, LLMs are AI, but nobody talks much about classifiers, you know? Um, and, and there's a lot of talk about using LLMs to do things that we used to have to build models to do. And, you know, LLMs, they can do summarization or they can do really cool things like change the voice. Like I can say, uh, make this more appropriate for marketing or, okay, now put this in a, com a comedic voice or something like that. And, and AI can do that. And that's really cool. But like in my own company, like the, the graph stuff that I do, the NLP stuff that I do, it, it is AI as much as anything else is AI. Absolutely. Um, it's constantly running, constantly reading, you know, and, and it's doing what I would otherwise have to do at a speed that I do it so i believe that ai is here um that said hype has always been a part of technology going back to the 90s for me <laughs> like um probably there was hype before the 90s but i'm, I'm going back to the 90s because that's that's my beginning um during their the late 90s there was so much hype about web development and some of it was accurate and some of it was exaggerated and a lot of what's going on Today, it feels just like hype did in the late 90s to me, like all the talk about e-commerce that people used to do mm -hmm. or, OK, now e-commerce is no longer relevant. We have to do m-commerce or u-commerce. And nobody talks about m-commerce or u-commerce anymore. But there was a week where people did, you know, <laughs> like they were trying to, to differentiate between the different types of commerces. And it's just always this chase of what's real and what's not real and so personally i have stuff to build and work to do and i can't stand it when people confuse me so i just personally i don't chase hype 
I chase the problems that I need to solve, and then I go find the tool that can help me solve that problem. So like these days, many of my problems are NLP and LLMs can be useful for that. But LLMs are not the only useful thing. Um, like I've, I've built my own clustering algorithms. I've written my own code to do certain things that aren't being done these days because it still needs to get done. There's so much important work that needs to get done. And when people just talk about the same exact thing over and over and over again, a lot of important stuff doesn't get addressed or talked about or idealized how to solve that problem, you know? So that's one, that's one of the reasons why I kind of get grumpy about hype. <laughs> yeah. I probably sometimes look a little bit bitter on LinkedIn, but I'm always chuckling. Um, I, I'm a really easygoing guy, but like hype is just, it's my kryptonite. Um, and it's always been that way. And as an engineer, you have to follow information. Like you have to, you have to get to the information that helps you solve your problem. And, and, uh, you know what I found, and I don't know if this is oversimplifying, um, there's maybe three or four distinct voices on this issue. Um, let's knock out the easy ones first. So there are the people, and I would say like you and me, who just want to get things done. Okay, mm -hmm. give me a tool, let's get it done. Then there's this group who are all about, oh, everything is just statistics. <laughs> you know, the hardcore mathematicians and I am sure you've seen them like oh it's all old-fashioned statistics there's nothing fancy about it I mean there's some shred of th truth there but that's a gross oversimplification then you've got the kind of the legit hypers <laughs> funny funny term like these yeah. are people who would say AI is capable of magic uh, everything can be done by AI AI this AI that a uh, subset of that would be the people who tend to conflate things like, oh, gen AI, but actually they're talking about, you know, uh, classifiers or gen AI, but they're actually talking about regression. I mean, uh, that actually adds to the confusion because gen yeah. AI is primarily content, you know, it's actually not even quantitative as far as output that's is right. concerned. It's qualitative. Yeah. And that's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. And then the, the fourth group of people are, are kind of the doomers, kind of catch all term for yep. it doesn't matter what it is it's going to kill us all so i find it interesting because maybe we've just recently recovered from the blockchain hype <laughs> i don't that's know if right. that's that's actually even done yet that people are kind of predisposed to be skeptical about ai because it could just be another blockchain and there's a little bit of ignorance there as far as i'm concerned because yep. ai predates blockchain but then this new gen AI sounds like a blockchain-ish type of a hype. And so people are kind of shying away from it. When the bottom line is, even the value gen AI produces, I'd say estimate, is not even 10% of the value that maybe more traditional established right. AI can do. But I think that's where it gets all murkied up. Like, okay, AI is capable of many things. Yeah, but you got to be specific what AI you're talking about. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, the people who would kind of dismiss Gen AI outright, mostly the stats crowd, are also kind yeah. of missing the point because right. it's not it's not supposed to do what you were doing. <laughs> uh, maybe that there's an inherent uh, fear as well on their part that, okay, uh, this Gen AI can't even add math. And yeah, no, yeah. it's not supposed to add. <laughs> it's supposed to write. <laughs> so I don't know. What do you think of that? I mean, do you agree with that uh, classification? It reminds so you remind me of a, uh, I took a screenshot of this picture. I'm going to read it. It says, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to accept what is true. Right. And um, like there, there is occasional animosity in the sciences. Like I'm, I'm reading about causality these days and, and, and some of the drama that existed in terms of that you know, in terms of that being taken seriously. Um, and apparently that that's still ongoing. And I, I'm an engineer, so I'm, I'm completely external to that. I had no idea that that was even going on. But to me, there is cause and effect. You know, there are things that are true. This causes that. So causality is something that should be explored. But, but apparently, even the sciences don't necessarily agree on that. And um, so... Like we can become too rigid in our thinking and we might be right hmm. in one thinking, 
But if we're so rigid that we can't pick up new information, then we're just stuck with that one thing, you know, so that's not any better. So I'm uh, I get called a mad scientist often. <laughs> um, like I, I, I just like to explore and try different things out, whether or not it's the the right way of doing things or or what. Like, I don't care. This is my code. This is I'm going to run it. And if it doesn't work at all, then it doesn't work at all. But in many cases, some of the ideas that I've had late at night, they did work. They were just a, a really unique way of approaching this. But yeah, um, with this AI stuff, for me, it's it's easy enough that like I, I was, I came on this before generative AI was even really a thing. Like yeah. I, I enjoyed building generative models and uh, I have a poem classifier that I wrote about in my book. Like I, it was really cool to make a Christmas poem generator um, back in 2020. And it makes really cute poems, but chat GPT would be way better these days, you know? So I'm, I'm very fond of generative AI and everybody should go play with it. But I know personally that classifiers are much more useful to me because classifiers, I'm usually looking for something and that's what classification is useful for. Um, and I know personally that clustering is less useful to me because I'm just not happy with K-means. Like I had to create my own clustering algorithm that was better. And um, and I did, um, but that's not ready for that. I can't share that with the world. And you just kind of learn what works and what doesn't work. And you learn what's hype and nonsense and, and what's not, you know, and, and you see your coworkers who chase shiny things. You, you see them kind of struggling to get things done. And you see other coworkers that are just on fire, knocking things out with simple approaches. So you just see things and you, and you get better as, as you watch and learn and, and, and stuff. But I'm, I'm sure that back in my beginning of data science, I would have fallen for a lot more than now. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then obviously as more time passes and more content is posted, I mean, this would be even harder to do maybe 10, 20 years ago because there wasn't enough information posted by people or there was information, but it was hard to access. You needed to be part of some institution or even the yeah. books. I mean, the books are, have gotten much cheaper now. I mean, it used to cost a fortune to buy some of these uh, technical books and you can't oh, yeah. even buy them anywhere else. You have to go to certain bookstores or whatnot. So, yeah. And, I, I, yeah. and I, I grew up in Japan. So like my earliest books were not even in my own language. Like I was reading <laughs> HTML books from Japanese, but I could understand the code because the code is English. You know, yeah. so I would just buy whatever I can and look at the code. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I think you can divide developers or engineers into two groups. They're... They're the ones kind of older generation who's, who love reading books. And then the newer guys, they just get it from YouTube or grab it from GitHub, um, which yeah. in a way is fast for sure. But there's something about a book. I mean, someone took the time to really lay out the information, put the principles yeah. behind it. And it's always, for me, I just get more comfort. I mean, I got a lot of books here at the back, you know, see? So nice. um, anyway, um, we're at the hour. And we've we've barely scratched the surface, so uh, certainly there's going to be episode two. Uh, but nice. you know, it was it was nice having you. Maybe um, a few parting thoughts for now about maybe let's target people who want to get into networks and NLP sure. or whatever. I mean, what's your words of encouragement for them? So uh, I would say jump into this. There's nothing there's nothing scary about it. Um, I have a book out, like people can go buy the book, but if, if money is tight or you can't get it in your country, I have a blog and that is 100 days of networks.substack.com. And I'm showing the same stuff that's in my book. So I'm not trying to get people to not buy my book, but, but here's some free stuff that you can read to learn the same stuff, you know, and, and the blog was written after my book. And so, you know, as I experiment and come up with new techniques, they get put on to my blog and they will inevitably get put into the second edition of my book. But what I want to say is that networks are in everything. They're source code. Um, source code follows networks. The food chain follows networks. Knowledge follows networks. Um, there's a book called Linked. If you want to kind of learn the layman's level type stuff on network stuff, uh, Alberto Varbasi wrote a book called Linked that is just a, 
a little tiny soft cover book that you can just read for fun. And that will, if that doesn't kick off the obsession, maybe nothing will because it's that good of a book. But I would say just jump in. And if you do jump in and if you do participate, like read my blog and stuff like that, message me on LinkedIn if you want to learn. Um, I, I daily talk to people who are reading my books and sometimes they get stuck and something doesn't work. I'll, I'll help you through the bugs. Like I, I wrote this book to broaden your horizons and open up your thinking. So I'll be here for you. Yeah, and uh, we'll be posting links to David's blog and his books uh, on Amazon in the description below. So anyway, th thanks a lot again, David, for giving us the time. And yeah, hope hope to catch you again in a future episode. Nice. I'll be happy to anytime. Thank you.